Message authentication codes are systems where the state of information is captured in something known as a MAC tag. And the MAC tag is calculated based on information and a symmetric key K. The integrity of the information can then be verified later on by recalculating the MAC tag under the same symmetric key K. Let's have a look at the flowchart on the left side to see how this works. The prerequisite to using message authentication codes is to have a symmetric key that is created and used for the purpose of calculating message authentication code tags. If we now assume to have such a symmetric key K, we can then take our plain text and together with the symmetric key K, trigger a MAC calculation, which will result in a MAC tag. The plain text together with the MAC tag could then be stored or sent to a receiving party that owns a copy of the symmetric key K, who then could verify the integrity of the plain text by recalculating the MAC tag with the same symmetric key K. And if the recalculated MAC tag is the same as the MAC tag received, the receiving party could conclude that the plain text received is correct and complete. If either the MAC tag associated with the plain text is wrong, or the plain text changed in the meantime, maliciously or not, or a wrong key was used to calculate or verify the MAC tag, the MAC verification process would fail. The questions that we now have left to answer are how does a MAC calculation really work? What is the notion of security associated with message authentication codes? And how could message authentication codes that are primitives serving the purpose of providing authenticity possibly be combined with primitives serving the purpose of confidentiality so that the plain text doesn't need to be sent in clear to, for example, our receiving party? One of the most famous message authentication codes is what is now known as hash-based message authentication code, or in short, HMAC. An HMAC is a system that was designed with having the hash functions message digest 5, SHA-1, and SHA-2 in mind, which are three hash functions that internally are built according to the same principles, and with that, all three of them vulnerable to the same classes of attacks. SHA-3 is internally built very different than message such as 5, SHA-1 and SHA-2, and as such, HMAC specifically doesn't immediately apply to SHA-3 hash functions as a construction. If an HMAC now makes use of message such as 5, then this construction is referred to as HMAC MD5. If an HMAC makes use of SHA-1, then this construction is referred to as HMAC SHA-1. If an HMAC makes use of SHA-2 with, for example, 256-bit hash values, then this construction is referred to as HMAC SHA-256, indicating with the missing two that HMACs were devised with primarily having SHA-2 as an underlying hash function in mind. How does this HMAC now really work? For this, let's have a look at the flowchart on the left. We know that HMACs are calculated for a plain text and under a given key. So our HMAC calculation gets the two inputs of a plain text and symmetric key K. Then internally, the symmetric key K first gets all of its bits XORed with a bit string represented in hex as OX3636. The result of this XOR is then concatenated with the plain text, and this concatenation of the plain text with the result of this first XOR is then simply hashed by the underlying hash function. Then HMAC actually conducts a second hash calculation, where the input to this second hash calculation is the result of the first hash calculation concatenated with the result of the bits of the symmetric key K 
XORed with a bit string represented in hex as OX5C5C. The result of this second hash calculation is then the resulting HMAC tag. From a security point of view, the security of HMACs are based on the length of the symmetric key K used, because short keys used allow for an attacker to easily figure out the key used by trying all the keys available until a valid MAC tag can be calculated, and the security of HMACs are also based on the property of the underlying hash functions used to be random looking functions, which very interestingly, even though we know that message such as 5 and SHA-1 are not collision resistant, is a property that still holds for all of the hash functions SHA-2 as well as message such as 5 and SHA-1. The question we at this point have left to answer is, how can authenticity that so far requires the information or the plain text to be transmitted in plain be combined with approaches for confidentiality so that we can have systems that provide both authenticity as well as confidentiality to the data exchanged. Authenticated encryption is now the name for a class of approaches to construct systems that can provide both authenticity and confidentiality to data. What we can see on the left side of this slide is the flowchart for a system known as encrypt then MAC approach. This is a system that combines primitives providing confidentiality with primitives providing authenticity, and as such, using this encrypt and MAC approach requires, as a prerequisite to using it, two symmetric keys, K1 and K2, to have been agreed on by both Bob, the sender, of the data and Alice, the receiver of the data, to be used for the encryption of the data and the MAC calculation on the data. Bob, as a sender of the plain text, in a first step takes the symmetric key K1 that he agreed on with Alice to use for the encryption, and with the symmetric key K1, encrypts the plain text into a ciphertext by making use of an asymmetric encryption cipher such as AES. Bob then, as a second step, takes the resulting ciphertext and the symmetric key K2 and calculates a MAC tag, now not of the plain text itself, but of the ciphertext. Bob then sends both the ciphertext as well as the MAC tag of the ciphertext to Alice. Alice, as the recipient, then receives something that up until that point she hasn't verified for authenticity and thus assumes that what she receives is just some ciphertext and some MAC tag. Alice then in a first step takes the ciphertext received as well as the symmetric key K2 she agreed on with Bob to use for the MAC calculation and calculates a MAC of the ciphertext that she received. Alice then verifies that the MAC tag that she just calculated herself is the same as the MAC tag that she received. If the MAC tag she calculated herself matches the MAC tag that she received, Alice assumes that the ciphertext obtained is really a ciphertext that was sent by Bob, and she proceeds then into decrypting the received ciphertext by making use of the symmetric key K1 to recover the original plaintext that Bob sent. As we can see, this encrypted MAC approach now really is an authenticated encryption approach as the plaintext is kept confidential by encrypting it before transmission and that the ciphertext comes together with a MAC tag that authenticates the ciphertext with respect to a key that was agreed on by the sender and the recipient. Although a sound approach to authenticated encryption, this encrypted MAC approach has the downside of being cumbersome due to the many keys involved and due to the overall approach essentially just being a layered approach providing both the required security goals of confidentiality and authenticity, where it takes conditional logic to unwrap the layers again on the recipient side. Let's have a look at alternative approaches that manage to improve on encrypt the MAC approach. Authenticated encryption with associated data is authenticated encryption that additionally binds the ciphertext to associated data. 
this associated data can be understood as the context that the data lives in and could, for example, be a TLS session or header fields of a data package where the payload of the data package itself is then encrypted. Authenticated encryption with associated data is now provided by various block cipher modes of operation with two of the most famous and widespread authenticated encryption with associated data block cipher modes of operation being the Galois counter mode GCM and the counter with CPC MAC mode CCM. On the left side, you can see the flowchart sketching how the Galois counter mode GCM roughly operates and manages to provide confidentiality as well as authenticity to data with just one symmetric key instead of multiple symmetric keys, like we have it with encrypted MAC approaches, and how the Galois counter mode combines confidentiality with authenticity in just one pass, instead of the layered approach we have with the encrypted MAC approaches. On the encryption side, the Galois counter mode is essentially just a counter mode, starting with an IV, then turning this IV into a counter that's encrypted with AES to form the ciphertext, this ciphertext then flows into what essentially is just a hash calculation, whose result is then again encrypted with a counter mode of operation. The result of this final encryption is then the authentication tag of the plain text. What now really turns this into an authenticated encryption with associated data approach is that the associated data the context of the data, so to say, flows into the calculation of the final authentication tag and as such manages to bind the data to the context living within the associated data. It's clear that this provides both confidentiality and authenticity to the data, that this works against a single symmetric key and that this is not a layered approach, but essentially a one pass combination of confidentiality and authenticity, and as such managed to improve on the encrypt the MAC approach that we got to know previously. This improvement, for example, also explains why in the newest TLS 1.3 version, the only two block cipher modes of operation allowed to be in use or the two authenticated encryption with associated data block cipher modes of operation, GCM and CCM.